Hello again, everyone, and thank you for participating in this webinar offered by the European School Education Platform, uh, the European Commission's platform for school education in Europe. Uh, my name is Magdalena, and I will be your host, your host for today. So, uh, for this webinar, we have invited uh, Mr. Fernando Saez, uh, who is a university lecturer with a strong knowledge and background on the field of education. And um, he will help us explore the different methodologies that assist uh, the skills development in the classroom, uh, emphasizing on the concept of academic optimism. Uh, before we begin, again, I would like to remind you that this is a recorded session. And uh, moreover, towards uh, the end of the webinar, we will serve with you an evaluation form. This uh, we kindly invite you to fill in. And uh, finally, we invite you to share your thoughts and questions through the chat, and uh, we will reply to all of them and discuss them at, towards uh, the end uh, of the webinar. Thank you all. Uh, Fernando, the floor is yours now. You can now start sharing your screen if you want. Thank you indeed, uh, Maria Elena, and uh, thanks everybody for attending this uh, webinar. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to share uh, some of my uh, ideas and works uh, with you today, and I hope uh, some of them may be interesting or useful or at least uh, thought provoking uh, so that we can think about them and we can uh, take some of these ideas to our schools and uh, classrooms. Uh, I have prepared a short presentation I would like to share with you if you don't mind. And uh, as you know, today's uh, webinar is titled the schools as skill generating environments and uh, most of the ideas are included in this uh, title. We will be talking about skills and how we can generate and help our students develop skills. But we we are talking about this skill generating uh, process from the school perspective. Obviously, first of all, thank you indeed for being here and attending this uh, webinar. Please feel free to use the chat to the chat to to write uh, your questions and to write your ideas or to share your worries about this uh, topic. Well, I would like to start with something we all share that something we all ag uh, agree upon. Uh, ancient dec uh, declaration 2015 uh, stated that education is a public good, a fundamental human right and a basis for guaranteeing the realization of other rights. But this basic idea, education as a, a fundamental human right, it's not just that by attending a school you are enjoying that human right. In fact, is skills development, which is the basic key to other basic human rights, literacy, numeracy, the capacity to interact with other people, the capacity to use technology. Those skills are the keys to open the doors for all our basic human rights. So it's not just a question of being there at school. It's a question of school helping you and helping our students to develop skills successfully. In fact, students, as the OECD uh, stated, will need to apply their knowledge in unknown and evolving circumstances. And it's for that that they will need a, a very broad range of uh, skills, including, and this is what we are going to be talking about, cognitive and metacognitive skills, for example, critical thinking, creative thinking, learning to learn or self-regulation, but also social and emotional skills, empathy, self-efficacy or collaboration, for example, and practical and physical skills. For example, using new information and communication technology devices, or also to be able to use their bodies in their way, in the best way to perform the different tasks they have to realize during the day. 
So skills are needed for life and they are going to be applied in unknown and evolving circumstances. But the problem is that in 1966, the Coleman Report in the United States definitely, definitely stated that socioeconomic factors determine learning achievement and that the teaching institutions are unable to counteract the impact of these factors. The Coleman Report, 1966, and this is one of the longest standing uh, statements and truths in our profession in education. So, socioeconomic factors determine learning achievement. Well, this is the end of this webinar, isn't it? We cannot do anything against these socioeconomic determining factors, or should we? I mean, do we have to fight the Coleman report or do we have to accept it and comply with it and say, OK, we cannot do anything about it? What do you think? Do we finish here or should we go on with the with the webinar? Well, obviously, the question is how can we teach and how can we help our students develop their skills despite the Coleman report? Failure at school is not genetic. It is a social construction. It's something we build or we do not build at our schools, at our cities, at our societies. School failure is not genetic. It's a social construction. For example, According to the educational philosopher Gerd Vieste, there are three domains of educational purpose. The first of these three domains is called by Vieste subjectification, and, and the, the call is be a self, be a self. The learners develop their own sense of initiative, their own sense of responsibility, rather than being objects to the actions of others. So the question is, how can we help our students subjectify themselves despite the Coleman report? The second uh, uh, domain of purpose of educational institutions is qualification. That is the transmission and acquisition of knowledge, skills and dispositions. So this, the second question is, how can we promote our students qualification despite the Coleman report? And thirdly, socialization, according to Gerd Biester's uh, proposal. Socialization meaning the construction of identity and oneself location in relation to others, in relation to traditions and social practices. These are the three domains according to Gerd Biesta, subjectification, qualification, socialization. So how can we promote subjectification skills qualification skills and socialization skills in a school context and despite the Coleman report. That is the question we want to try and answer today. Learning is not a simple process. Learning, in fact, is quite a very complex process. According to Nude Eyeries, Two different processes which are weaved, which are woven together, must happen for us to learn anything. The first one, all learning, uh, the first one imply uh, an external interaction process between the learner and his or her social, cultural or material involvement. So, first uh, process, an interaction between the self and the environment, and then an internal psychological process of elaboration and acquisition of that interaction which has previously occurred. So, 
these two processes are in fact how skills uh, appear. Skill development happens in, and I love this expression, point of service sessions. That is activities which are experienced by the learners in which teachers, staff offer high quality instruction and high quality content. But the uh, role of the staff, of the teachers, the faculty, is to promote the youth engagement in that learning situation, promoting teens' interest, behavior, and the level of challenge that they experience. So, skill development happens as a, as a consequence of this point of service sanctions. So, in this new paradigm, we are not mere content providers. Teachers are not mere content providers. Teachers are something else, a bit more complex, but also I would say much more satisfying than being just a mere content provider. In this new paradigm, learning is understood to happen as a consequence of change. Learning means change as a consequence of participating in a situation and an experience that allows us to acquire new knowledge or develop new skills. So learning is change because of that participation in, an, in a learning situation, in a learning experience. So a new vocabulary for this new paradigm. Teachers create and use the affordances which surround the learning situation, the possibilities, the opportunities, which is what uh, hides after that uh, expression of affordances. And the teacher's uh, role is to provoke investment, students' investment. What is investment? Well, we are at our research group, we, have, we are stopping uh, about talking uh, on uh, motivation because we want to emphasize that motivation is not enough in the 21st century. It's not that your students bring motivation in their backpack. They must invest in the learning situation. They must invest their resources. They must invest their, their cognitive resources. They must invest their time. They must invest their interest. So they must put into play all they have so to get out and so to uh, bring out of their learning situation all the learning opportunities. And that means being aware of the assets and the constraints of the learning situation. And it means to provide the students with agency. And it's that agency which provokes learning. So a new vocabulary for learning in the 21st century. And also new questions, how to provoke investment? Well, let's try and answer these three questions. Can learners make sense of the learning experience in the light of their own knowledge, beliefs and experiences and the situation in which they find themselves? Can they make sense of the learning experience? A second question about ownership. Does the learner own the learning activity which provokes the learner's mental and physical investment in it? Does the learning situation uh, belong to the learner or is it is the learner an external person, someone who is not uh, in control of the situation? And finally, agency. Does the learning situation and activity allow creation or intervention in our environment? So, sense making, ownership, agency, these are the new words, the new vocabulary for learning in the 21st century. 
agency is particularly important because agency understood as the capacity of people to act upon, to influence and to transform their activities and circumstances is the basic element for learners to uh, make use and to get the most of the learning situation. So thinking in terms of agency is what is what allow our students to develop their skills. And in that sense, there is a radical change in what teaching means. I really agree with this uh, quotation. Many instructors have now moved away from a sole diet of traditional lecture with the occasional short answer question to the class in which students just listen, repeat and occasionally apply toward a modified menu of pedagogical platforms, meaning those pedagogical platforms, different ways of teaching. And in those uh, new pedagogical platforms, students are active participants in the learning process. In fact, what lies uh, behind that quotation is the answer to this question by Mizuko Ito in 2016. Why should, be, should we be sitting kids down in rows to learn maths in the abstract when it is both more engaging and effective to learn it in the real world or through meaningful social activity? That is the question which makes us teachers need new teaching platforms, new ways of understanding teaching so that we can uh, bring efficacy to our teaching task. David Perkins in his book Making Learning Whole explained this new way of teaching as playing the, the whole game. And uh, he wrote in settings of learning, playing a whole game, a whole game is generally some kind of inquiry or performance in a broad sense. And it involves problem solving, explanation, argument, evidence, strategy, skill, craft, and often something, something gets created, a solution, an image, a story, an essay, a model. So this is the new paradigm in which teachers are not just content providers. They are the, the people who design the whole game, who write the rules and then give out that game to their uh, students so that the students can develop their agency and through their agency, the skills they need. They need. And in order to design that whole game and make the educational experience more immersive, more experiential, more real world and more hands on, the possibilities are numerous. For example, experiential learning, challenge based learning, project based learning, inquiry driven learning, activity focused, team based, case based, gamified, adaptive or personalized learning. So many new possibilities to design learning situations. Let's go through some of them, only some of them, those who are under the umbrella term of inductive teaching methods. Inductive teaching methods normally start from a question or a problem, which is settled within a context and they create a real game, but with complex and open ended real world problems and they offer a context for the learner to uh, understand the, the problem. And uh, in that context, students must self-direct, must be proactive, must collaborate, must cooperate with other students. And the possibilities are many 
in this context. For example, inquiry-based learning, which is a pedagogy which enables students to experience the process of knowledge creation. Coming from a question, we uh, enter an inquiry, we enter a process of discovery, of bringing together information to find a, an answer or to find a solution for our question. Or problem-based learning, which as you know, appeared to help medical school students learn basic science knowledge in a way that would be not only more lasting, but also useful in clinical context. So problem-based learning was not just an occurrence that teachers might have had. It was a way, a very efficient way of preparing uh, doctors in order to be more uh, uh, able to stand in clinical situations. Or case-based and problem-based uh, situations in which authentic cases are studied and analyzed normally in a real-world setting and in which the students must apply basic knowledge in order to solve that case or to solve that problem. Or moving to vocational and training education, work-based learning, which means to create the learning situation in a workplace and try to solve the problems which normally happen in a workplace. And in order to do that, the student, the students, the learners must apply knowledge from different fields, from different subject matters they may, uh, they may be studying. So work-based learning means solving real work problems in a workplace situation. So these, uh, all these elements uh, may also be related to what we normally call project-based learning. And in fact, when we are asked about our proposal for skill development, our uh, answer is uh, threefold. We believe that the sum of project-based learning together with multiple literacies and a whole school approach can help our students develop their skills in a more efficient way. Well, project-based learning is a cycle of discovery, is a cycle of design, is a cycle of uh, getting hands into real life uh, problems. Project-based learning starts with engagement, starts when both teachers and learners face a driving question or a driving problem or a driving uh, situation in which they have to solve a challenge they are facing. And after that, there is a cycle of planning and producing, which means searching for and managing information, then knowledge building and skill development. And with that knowledge and those skills, they must create some sort of final product. And after that, we have the two final steps of closure and dissemination. Well, the, first of all, the challenge. In fact, at that step, the challenge is where we must uh, think back about those three questions we have uh, stated uh, a few minutes ago, ownership, sense-making, agency. Well, is the challenge and consequently the project relevant to my students? Does it promote ownership, sense-making and agency? That is, those are the questions to consider when designing the challenge of our project. Planning is the moment in which we invoke 
the knowledge we need to solve the question, the driving question or the problem. Because in at that step, planning is where we ask ourselves how we can face the challenge and what we may need to solve that challenge. And normally in a school context or in a learning context, what we need are knowledge and skills. And that is a moment when we need to read, when we need to uh, write, when we need to talk to other students, to learners, to agent um, people, to external people who may help us build our knowledge and build our skills. And after that, we apply that content knowledge and those skills into the implementation phase in which we create the final product. And in fact, one of the features of project based learning is that the creation of products of. Real products, maybe analogical, maybe digital are of real importance because they help the products. The final product helps learners to integrate and reconstruct their knowledge, the process of discovery and to improve in case we are in a higher education context or in a workplace context to improve their professional skills and increase their interest in the discipline and the ability to work with other people. And then after that, we must devote some time to the closure, that is to reconsider what we have been able to do and how we were able to do it. And after the closure, we must disseminate what we have done so that other people may learn from us and also so that we can be assessed through self uh, evaluation, co evaluation, or hetero evaluation. And in case you may be thinking that project based learning is another occurrence. Obviously, project based learning is one of the most well known pedagogical strategies. It's more than 100 years uh, old, and there are plenty of research evidence about the validity of project based learning. I bring here a publication 2019 revisiting the effects of project based learning on a student's academic achievement. It's the latest meta analysis about project based learning that we can find in the literature and the results are quite conclusive. The meta analysis of 20 years of research present a quantitative uh, effect size estimate of 0 0.71 based on individual stay studies. So we have evidence of a medium to large positive effect on a student academic achievement in project based learning in comparison to traditional instruction. And also. The results of project based learning are better now than 20 years ago, which means that we teachers as a profession, we are learning on how to discern. We are improving how uh, we design projects and we are much more effective now than in the um, 20th century concerning projects. We are improving our uh, professional skill too. In case you want to design projects, we uh, created a canvas that you can find there on that website I'm sharing with you right now uh, using the chat, which I find quite empty. Uh, that's it. Now I, I can read the chat. And on the chat, uh, you have uh, the uh, URL to download that uh, canvas, both in Spanish, which is our mother tongue, and English. And in that canvas, you can you can use that canvas to design creatively projects and. Uh, and then digital transformation, because we are not teaching any longer in a 
and in an, analog in an analogical uh, context, in an analogical setting, we are in the midst of a digital revolution. Perhaps we could make the distinction between digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. And, and, it, and it means digitization is when we use digital products. Uh, just using a PDF is digitization. But we are not in that moment uh, any longer. We are not on that position any longer. Digitalization is when the processes, the teaching and learning processes are being digitalized and we are establishing contact with our students through digital means and we are creating knowledge together through digital means and we are assessing our students through digital means. And digital transformation is when the whole school is changing to become digital. So many possibilities because educational technologies are a real challenge for education. Using learning management systems, using social media and collaborative technologies, using curating, evidencing and showcasing learning and professional capabilities, the co digital communication, the use of mobile applications, assessment and evaluation in digital context, presentation and learning resources through digital tools, and finally, the use of learning objects and resources. All of these are real challenges for us as teachers. And the problem is that there are a wide number of reports that are telling our institutions that if we want to be relevant in the 21st century, we need to embrace the opportunities afforded by technology, particularly in relation to teaching and learning practices. I'm really happy to know that many of you are participating in e-twinning experiences, are participating in Erasmus Plus digitally concerned projects, because we must, as a school, as a learning institution, keep relevant uh, in digital terms. But the problem is that many of our efforts are being expended trying to replicate models of in-person schooling, we could say 20th, 20th century schooling in digital spaces. And we learned and somehow our students suffered many of these experiences during the pandemic and the lockdowns. Online and virtual environments demand new types of learning content and new pedagogies. It's not just to move what I did, what I was doing in uh, in-person schooling to digital uh, platforms. But the problem is, but the real problem is that we have constraints, we have limits, and we also have problems. And as Michael Fulham writes, when we try something radically new, there are immediate and practical losses, while the potential benefits are longer term and theoretical. So, asking anyone to change is asking too much. Only if, at, uh, if at our schools we have strong social pool factors, we will change. Only with very strong social ties, we will change and we will adapt ourselves to this crazy 21st century. Because in fact, people's capacity to cooperate, as Richard Sennett wrote, is much greater and more complex than what normally institutions allow. So we are much more powerful uh, as uh, people who want to cooperate at schools than what the institution normally allow. And that is how I want to end this webinar, building on our capacity to cooperate, 
because in fact, more than individual actions, schools are the lever to generate skills for all our students. It's not the individual teacher, but the whole school who can affect the whole child. In fact, children and adolescents need a balanced set of cognitive, social and emotional skills in order to achieve positive outcomes in school, in work and in life. But how can we build that balanced set if it all depends on individual teachers, on the lottery of having a good or bad teacher? If we rely on that lottery for our students and learners to build this balanced set, the likelihood is that we will be unfair and we will build we will be building inequity at schools if we rely on individual teachers we'll be building inequity because in fact research indicates that interventions are more successful when they are integrated into everyday practice into the school culture, in when they engage the whole staff, when they reinforce skills outside the classroom, in the hallways, in the playgrounds, when they invoke the importance of that partnership with the families, and when they also coordinate work with outside agencies, the whole school, the whole community, to attend the whole child. A whole school approach aims to work to integrate scale development into all those moments using the collaborative power people may have. In the field of health and education, at that point in which health and education meet, which is so important to get successful, uh, important educational outcomes. There is a, a model, there is a theory, the whole school, whole community, whole child model, which is telling us that we must focus on the student, but at the same time remain, we, we must think in terms of whole school and community to offer the children uh, all the resources for them to develop their skills. In fact, in this uh, whole school, whole community, whole child model, they are using this 10 uh, point element to promote health and education. And we should think in similar terms to promote skills because in fact, all these elements are important also for skill development. So let's finish talking about academic optimism. Academic optimism is a label, evidence-based, research-based, to make us think about our own institutions, to make us think about our own schools. So, so what is academic optimism? Well, let me tell you what it is not. Academic optimism is not related to being an optimistic person. Uh, uh, we are not concerned uh, with you being optimistic or pessimistic. Be as you prefer to be. Uh, if you like being optimistic, that's OK for us. If you want to remain pessimistic about the future, hey, that's OK for us, too, because this is not related to being optimistic or pessimistic. It's a bit more complex. In fact, academic optimism is the teacher's optimism about teaching and learning in their own school. So it's the way we think about teaching and learning at our schools. And in fact, schools can improve despite the Coleman report. 
schools can improve in spite of low socioeconomic status by cultivating an optimistic perspective shared by teachers. Academic optimism is malleable, can be learned and can be increased and we can make it grow and provoke better outcomes thanks to our academic optimism because there is a, a positive relationship, a positive correlation between academic optimism and achievement and the higher uh, academic optimism is the higher uh, school uh, achievement, learning achievement, learning outcomes are. So there is a positive correlation. These two concepts, academic optimism and achievement, are not only compatible, but also complementary. And, and uh, it's not just a question of the whole school being optimistic academically optimistic, but also when we consider teacher after teacher, it, the same happens with academic optimism. Studies not only of a school academic optimism, but studies of teacher, individual teacher academic optimism also suggest that this is a crucial factor for fostering student academic achievement. And, and what is academic optimism? Well, it's made up of three elements, three factors. Teachers' collective efficacy, the academic emphasis of the institution, and trust. And let me start with trust, because in fact, trust is the moderator in research terms a moderator is a factor which may uh, rise or put down the other two factors. And trust is the moderator in academic optimism. When teachers create a safe and trusting environment, students feel comfortable to take chances and learn from their mistakes. We cannot have agency without trust. We cannot have ownership without trust. We cannot create efficient, appropriate learning situations without trust in students. Fostering trusted, trusting relationships between teachers and students is one of the most potent ways a school leader can create the conditions for innovation in their schools. So, trust is the, the cornerstone for academic optimism. And academic optimism is the key for this whole school approach to skill development. But after trust, we need teacher efficacy. That is, we want teachers to believe that they are able to affect student learning, to help them, to be that scaffolding that our students need, to set higher expectations for our students, to exert greater effort from them, and to be more resilient when things are difficult. And also, when teachers have a great knowledge, have great knowledge of teaching and learning, then they are also more appreciated and they are more effective in their teaching task. This is a quotation by Linda Darling Hammond, the uh, North American um, expert on education. Teachers with greater knowledge of teaching and learning. And finally, teacher sense of academic emphasis. And this is the end of this academic optimism uh, factor. Teachers' sense of academic emphasis, or sometimes called academic press, is the degree to which teachers find ways to engage students in an appropriate academic task. Is the way we move our students to the best possible learning outcomes. So these are the three elements 
of academic optimism, trust, collective efficacy, academic emphasis. And when school academic optimism rises, we, consist, uh, we have consistently been uh, find, we have consistently found that this promotes student achievement regardless of a student population or nationality. So this is the key to solve the, uh, the Coleman report. This is to the way to fight the results of the Coleman report, academic optimism and a whole school approach to a scale development. And that is and that is the role that is a task we have ahead to build a future in which academic academic optimism is possible at our schools and uh, a future in which we turn as our schools into enabling uh, settings, into enabling institutions for teachers, students and families so that they can uh, achieve the best learning results through these elements of academic optimism. There is not just one future, but many possible futures. And now it depends on us and our present actions to think and create uh, the, the best possible future for all of us. So the future is open. I hope some of the ideas that we have that I have presented may be useful for you, may be interesting and relevant for you. And now let's start imagining, let's start, let's start designing our uh, schools to be as powerful as possible to develop skills and to become enabling institutions for academic optimism. Thank you indeed. And uh, Maria Elena, the floor is yours to, uh, um, to see if there are some questions or or some uh, debate in the chat. Indeed, we have uh, some uh, uh, pretty nice comments here. Um, uh, teachers are mostly concerned about the time that they need to implement all those changes. They are so they are very concerned about this, and I think it's. Normal, if you could uh, provide us some input on that. Sure, because in fact, time is uh, probably the most important uh, factor to consider if any process of change will be uh, realistic and then to consider the likelihood of its uh, final result. The question is that any innovation or any process of change in school terms is pluriannual. That is, we must think always in long periods of time. Because in fact, there is a, a very interesting concept in philosophy, which is uh, called uh, heterochronicity, which means that there are some fields which uh, go forward very fast. For example, technology. We are learning to use ChatGPT now, and perhaps there is something which will appear tomorrow and will change everything radically once again. But some fields change in a very slow pace. That is with what happens with school. So any school which is trying to implement any process of change cannot think in terms of a semester. We must think in terms of one academic year, two academic years, three academic years. And I would, I would even suggest that any process of change should start with a zero year. That is a year in which nothing happens, apparently, but we are just building the change and we devote that year in which everything runs as always to read together, to talk together, 
to design, but not to implement, to write down, but not to change anything, to have all the elements gathered together in that zero year. And then on the following year, we start implementing changes. For example, we have worked with literally hundreds of schools implementing project-based learning in Spain, and we always demanded them to, to, to be calm, keep calm, keep calm, use that zero year, let's watch other colleagues work, let's visit other schools, let's read, because we are a reading profession. Zero year and then a pluriannual uh, perspective towards change. And in fact, time is the basic word to be successful in any process of innovation. Now, this is a very useful advice because uh, sometimes we expect change to happen uh, the next day. <laughs> certainly, in, certainly. Yeah, and it never early. happens in education. And when it happens, um, in terms of sustainability, that change is quite questionable. It normally happens that these rapid changes uh, provoke more problems than solutions. And normally they are uh, changed back to the previous situation in a very short period of time. So it's much better to, to move slowly, but in a very uh, sustainable way. Yeah, this is a very useful uh, advice. Small changes, one step at a time. Gotcha. And uh, as you mentioned during the whole webinar, collaboration is a very important. Collaboration and effective communication between teachers. I, I would really say, Marianella, that before any change, we must build up those strong social ties that we mentioned using Michael Fullen's uh, uh, statement, strong social ties. If if we have a, a new, an educational institution, schools or, or non-formal non -formal institutions in which the faculty, the teachers are strong together, they have a real commitment to change, they, they have made a diagnosis, okay, which are our problems seriously um, and how can we solve it? Let's design, let's think together the possible um, changes, the possible uh, results that we want to achieve in two years time. So if this group of teachers are really well packed uh, together and, uh, and cooperation has been built using informal and formal ways of creating uh, cooperation. Uh, th there is an author, uh, Marianella, called Nancy Dixon, and Nancy Dixon explains how important corridors, corridors are to, to, to build strong social ties. If your corridors are empty, you have a problem because people are not sharing knowledge if, uh, uh, along the corridors and it's important to to use those informal situations to create knowledge in the community of practice which is a concept which has not appeared but it is so so important we are communities of practice and we must think about our practices the results that our practices are are having and how we can change it and that takes time, going back to the first question. Indeed, and I would like to read a, a last comment from Athanasia. Yeah. Um, Hands-on activities, connections with the community, critical thinking, metacognitive activities through students' creations uh, are ancient terms? No. And uh, they are very stable over the, over the time, and the means to implement them change, but the principles are there. What do you think on that? Yeah, I, in fact, at this time, at this time of of the history of uh, of educational sciences, we are quite sure that th that there is a very strong line, um, which is inviting us at least to enrich 
uh, traditional instruction with other ways of teaching. And uh, some of the ways have been uh, mentioned during the presentation. Some of them ha uh, have been mentioned by, by this colleague. And we have so many evidences of its efficacy. The problem is that sometimes we do not work in a context which enables us to be adventurous. And we need to be a little bit adventurous and, and think. In, in this semester, I'm going to use a week for projects. We used that uh, strategy when we uh, when we were invited by a school who was interested in project based learning, but at the same time reluctant to change many things. We we told them use just one week a year, only one. Nothing bad may happen to your students where if you waste a week and then analyze that week, consider what you as a teacher have learned, consider the, the satisfaction that you have provoked in your students. So we need to be at least a bit adventurous and uh, try new ways of teaching. And I'm really sure I'm really sure that many of our colleagues here have felt that sense of being brave enough at, at some time of their uh, um, profession to change something in the way they were teaching. We need that uh, sensation of bravery, but also we need enabling structures. And I insist on that because enabling structures are a result of policies, policies are a result of consensus at educational institutions. It's not magic. It's a result of willingness to let teachers be brave. Marianella. Thank you so much and thank you everyone. Um, as my colleague shared with you, we have a survey. Uh, we would like you to fill in if you have some time. I am resharing the uh, link with you on the chat. Um, some questions concerning technicalities. Yes, this recording will be uploaded from um, next week onwards uh, to our uh, YouTube channel. You can find us as a European School Education Platform. You can find it there. Uh, the, PowerPoint, the PowerPoint presentation will be also uh, on the webinars uh, page on ESEP. Um, I think uh, that's it from us. And uh, Fernando, we would like to thank you. Um, for uh, for you who are interested, we will also have a short course uh, in September, some point in September with Fernando. He will help us uh, delve into uh, technology use in um, language education and language teaching. Uh, but uh, more, um, we will inform you about that later in the summer. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and we hope to see you in um, a next webinar or an online course of ours. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Marinella. See you all. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a nice evening.